got an Akai GX365 in for service. This one here has a problem with the pinch roller. After it warms up, it doesn't work properly. So we're gonna see what's causing this problem. It actually has more problems than this. One of them was caused by the owner who did their own service and had a little bit of an oops, but we'll figure that one out when I get to it. Let's deal with this pinch roller problem first. Today I'm working on an Akai GX365D. This is an auto reverse reel to reel. This one has been modified. I say that because out of the box these ones ship with one and three quarter, three and one and seven eighths, three and three quarter, and seven and a half IPS. This one's been modified so it's three and three quarters, seven and a half, and fifteen IPS. There's uh, seven and a half. There's fifteen and there's three and three quarters. So these ones were modified. Complaint on this one is that um, once it warms up, the pinch roller will not engage properly. Now anyone who knows anything about these units, when you select reverse, there is a delay before the unit goes into reverse. That is totally normal. But what is not normal is the hum that we're starting to hear from the solenoid, the plunger. And that will get more predominantly loud as this thing runs. So let's let it run for a bit and uh, see if I can duplicate the symptom. These units were kind of neat because they used a single playback head unlike say the the GX265 which I have which uses a center mounted capstan and pinch roller and it uses six separate heads three for each direction this one here actually only uses one head for both directions and here's how they played the reverse direction watch the playback head when I changed modes see there's a a plunger that actually shifts the head so that it can play the reverse direction. The, the problem with the design like this, of course, is that when it's playing in the reverse direction, uh, you're at the mercy of the, the, the take-up torque from the uh, supply side, which has now become the take-up. Because you're, and the wound flutter obviously won't be as good in the reverse direction because your capstan and pinch roller, which is what's regulating your speed, is actually what's feeding the tape in. For example, if I were to stop the tape here, you'll see that the tape will just spill, right? So it's the playback in the reverse mode on these isn't as good as it is in the forward mode. And it only records in one direction, whereas the GX260, because it's got a center mounted capstan uh, and a center mounted pinch roller, uh, actually performs better in that respect because it has three heads for the forward direction and three heads for the reverse direction with a center mounted capstan. It also reverses instantly. I can change modes back and forth and the, the motor just stops and reverses. There's no, there's no delay like there is on this one, which this one has a few second delay to go into forward. And it has a much longer delay to go into reverse. as you can see. Okay, now this thing's been running for a while. Watch what's happening when I hit play. Really, are the uh, solenoid is chattering a bit. So that's the complaint I've got. The longer it runs, it will actually continue to get worse to the point where it won't even engage the pinch roller at all. That is the problem. That's the first problem. So we're going to have to disassemble the unit to find out what's causing this problem. I'm going to remove the screws. Lift the front off. I gotta take the. I gotta take off the uh, pinch roller here first too.
just going to tie up the auto stop arm here out of the way so it doesn't activate a switch so that I can operate this without a tape in place and observe what is going to happen and it starts to chatter if we look down at the schematic diagram here this is our play our pinch roller plunger right there and there's a diode across it and you see there's a little switch it's marked switch 4 and what switch 4's job is to do is there's a four point it's a four R4 looks like three three point one K thirty one K yeah there's a resistor in here anyway um, I think what it does is when the plunger is activated in order for the plunger to quickly activate it needs full power but once the plunger has activated it needs less power to operate and I I get the stinking suspicion that the switch is not activating it would be controlled it would be it would be triggered I think by the mechanism itself so I'm looking at this to try and find it I think I found it and it should activate when the unit is in play or reverse play it will it's normally closed until it's activated and once it's activated it opens and it'll then allow the current to in play mode it would be like this in stop it would be closed and when it opens it dumps current through R4 which will reduce the current to the plunger this plunger is getting quite warm just operating it here so this is the plunger here and say this is actually quite warm now after only a few minutes it's really getting warm and I believe this is switch 4 right there as you can see when it operates that switch is supposed to open and it doesn't look like it is because this lever does not appear to be pushing it up high enough to operate it's not it's not closing that switch I think that's the problem we'll just measure that switch and see if that switch is opening when it's in play so when the switch is closed I see no voltage across the switch when the switch opens I should see voltage across the switch and I'm not but if I press the switch up I now have voltage across it about 87 volts that I believe is the problem with this is the switch is out of adjustment and it's applying full current across this plunger normally the plunger will have full power to close the plunger and once it once it engages it drops the voltage down so that the plunger doesn't overheat because this is getting really warm and this switch is not activating at all and if I if I adjust the switch a little bit here I haven't done anything on here look at how loose those screws are the switch itself has probably slipped out of position because it can be adjusted that's what's happened on this thing that switch has moved we're going to take this into play we're going to drop this down to the point where it's engaging there now you can see that the switch is on now it's off and we want the switch on 89 volts that is what's supposed to operate on this now this won't get warm I'll let this thing run for a while but this thing won't get warm now guaranteed that was the problem. 
the screw had worked its way loose and this allowed this to slip and the switch tilted up slightly so that the bar was not activating it and what that does is that provides as I say that's what provides the current limiting here for the, the pinch roller solenoid it needs full current so the switch is in the closed position to bypass this resistor so when you hit the button it gets full current to close the solenoid and then once the solenoid is engaged the switch can open so it provides limited current so that it doesn't burn up the uh, solenoid and there's a resistor that's up in the top of the unit right up about here that's the current limiting resistor so on this side that's big it's going to be a big wire wound resistor right up in the corner here that's the current limiter for these things okay I've had this thing running now for a while this solenoid has cooled down substantially this was so hot before I adjusted this switch that I couldn't put my finger on it it was getting to the point where it was almost burning me and of course that was causing this thing to chatter like you saw I think it's fairly safe to say had this not been serviced and the owner of this continued to use it as it was that this solenoid would have overheated and burned out there's no question in my mind that this would have burned out the coil would got would gotten so hot that the uh, enamel on the wire on the winding would have shorted it would have melted the enamel and it would have shorted and would have been difficult to try and find a part for one of these because these are pretty old and this is a pretty good this is a pretty darn good deck the only thing I don't like about it is the uh, the way it selects the track for reverse see how nice and smooth it is now none of this chattering back to forward that's how it's supposed to operate and you'll notice the meter right when it first starts I it's reading negative just because I've I've got my probes reversed here if I, if I reverse this I read positive 90 volts because we're measuring DC it doesn't matter right Another interesting thing about this is this reverse matic What the reverse matic is on these units is you set where you want it to reverse. So when you turn on the reverse matic so you want it to reverse when it gets to there. When the tape is playing, the outer dial here is geared to the tape counter. So as the tape would play, once it gets down to where it's set, it'll automatically go into reverse. So if you have a tape that's not fully, uh, not you know, not fully recorded, it would switch at the point where you set it. It's not going to be that accurate, but it's it would be it would get the job done because it doesn't have a sensing. Uh, I think it has a sensing on the. It has a sense on this side. Stop there. See now it'll reverse and normally. When it goes into reverse mode, of course, your reel is going to turn this way now, and this is going to go back the other direction. It'll take me forever to do this this way, but as it's as the tape is playing, this is going to go back the other way, and once this gets up to the 12 o'clock position, it goes back the other direction again. That's how the reverse matic works controlled by that switch just for those that wonder what that's for or what that adjustment does you set it at zero at the beginning at your starting point 
and then you would set it for how far you wanted it to play. And of course that would depend on the length of the tape. Anyway, that's what that gadget is. It does have an auto stop. Um, doesn't have, I don't think it has sensing on this side. It only has sensing on this side for the metallic strips on the tape. I know that it has a it has a sense line on this side so that if this it'll stop. Right? If you have, if you have a metallic now will it go the other way? Oh yes it does. It does go the other way. What if I short it again? Will it go forward? It would play it and then stop. So you would use this to trigger it to go back the other way. So let's just thread up the tape. I can do this without putting the, the face on it for now. And we can just test it. I'm going to check the standard stuff on here, even though I should there should not be any alignment required to the heads because um, they're paint sealed, so they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't need an alignment. But I'll check the bias and stuff. We'll do some test recordings on this unit. I'll plug it into my sound system. Oops. That is the leader on my tape here. It has a metallic leader. This tape's actually got 15 IPS as well on it. On the on the other, it's it's recorded in the same direction. So the only way I can play the 15 IPS on this is on a real four channel deck. If I turn, if I, if I go to the end of the tape and, and turn the tape over, uh, it will play backwards because the, the second side are, are basically, uh, uh, tracks one and three are forward and tracks two and four are the 15 IPS. It was recorded on my, see, one and three is seven and a half, two and four is 15 IPS. So of course the only way I can play the 15 IPS on this tape is to trick it by pushing the head in. Then we can play the other 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 channel. So if I, because normally that would be in the reverse direction it'll play backwards. So if I do that, now we can hear the 15 IPS because I'm tricking it. See this was recorded on my four, my four track and I recorded them the same direction. Now I could have recorded it and turned the tape over and recorded the other side going the other direction, but when I recorded it on my, my four track, I did it, uh, I recorded tracks um, one and three, rewound the tape and then recorded tracks two and four at 15 IPFs on my other, my uh, TIAC. If I release the head. <laughs> So that would be a mod you could do something like this. Energize the relay that operates the head to play the other tracks. So before I put this together, I'm going to rewind the tape here, take the tape off. Um, I'm going to demagnetize the heads, at least the play head is what needs to be demagnetized more than the others because the other ones will, will self-demagnetize as soon as you uh, put it into record. I'll throw, I'll thread up my, uh, my test tape and we'll just do some, we'll record some tones and see how the levels look on this unit here. I'm not going to get into the into tweaking biases and stuff like that on because I don't feel like tearing it down any more than I have 
Uh, it was brought to me for the solenite problem, so uh, that's what I. That's what it was brought to me to find why it was chattering, which I did, and now you guys know what causes it. That switch gets out of adjustment. Um, I will test it and see how it sounds. And, oops, and then I can send this one on its way. I love this thing; it just spin forever. That's a tape stabilizer. It's a big flywheel. It's not driven by anything, right? It's just a flywheel. The reason that that has to be there on this unit is because for reverse playback, this acts as your speed regulator. It gets it gets moving and keeps your tape under tension on reverse play because you know it's not being pulled through by a capstan and pinch roller. It's actually being pushed through. Another downside to these things is if you don't tighten this up tightly it will actually spin that off when you're in reverse and you'll end up with your uh, pinch roller on the ground. So I've got my homemade demagnetizer here. Shut off the power so that there's no power going through the amps. And I'm just going to bring the demagnetizer in close to the heads but not touching the heads. And this will degauze the heads themselves. In case you guys didn't see me make this, it's just a, some magnet wire wrapped around an iron screw. Put some heat shrink tubing around so that it, you know it won't scratch anything. And I just it, I just power it up with a 12 volt AC transformer, and uh, it produces a significant magnetic field. Draws quite a bit of current. This will heat up after a few minutes, so you can't leave it running for. Or in a few minutes but it produces a significant AC magnetic field that will completely neutralize any um, magnetic buildup in the playback heads. The record and the race head is not so much of a problem because whenever you put the machine into record it is going to the, the bias oscillator is going to remove any residual magnetization that happens on the record and the erase head. And on two head decks, it's not even really necessary to demagnetize the heads. If you put it into record at all, it will automatically neutralize the head. But on three head decks, because you have a dedicated playback head that never gets a record bias on it, so the, the playback head can and will over time pick up a slight magnetic field from the tapes that's playing. So it's a good idea to demagnetize these once in a while. This thing has more problems besides the fact that it had a problem with this. This is going to require some more investigation. You see, this unit is not erasing tapes. You know, when I put it into record, well, I've got a source going in here. I put it into record, well if I put it into play first of all, you hear a tone on the tape, if I hit record, it's not erasing the tape. Something else I've noticed is that uh, the level controls have no effect. Something's been messed up on here, and it, it's going to be the owner of it that went in and recapped this thing. Guaranteed, either that or that didn't work when they got the unit. They bought it used, but the owner of the unit recapped it themselves. Something's not right in this record. Now I'm going to have to dig into this thing and see why it's not erasing the tape. This one could be an interesting, uh, an interesting problem. I hadn't planned on having to tear the deck down. But now it looks like, I'm looks like I'm going to have to to find out why it's not uh, erasing the tape and why the record level is not working. Do you see the line levels aren't doing the thing? Oh, maybe that's why. Okay, well that explains that. That button was in. That still does not explain why when I put it into record, it's not erasing the tape. This thing's got auto level control. Watch this. I just noticed this. 
That's what this button does. It's called Compute Omatic. If I turn it on, well, it's off now. It's on now. If I turn it on, watch this thing here when I pause the music. Oh, I'm just gonna make a liar out of me. It does. It does move. Trust me. When the level is loud, it moves. There. See? Look. It just moved. If I turn the volume down on this thing, See what I mean? When you turn it on, it looks, it looks at the levels. And if I crank the levels way up on this, <laughs> it turns automatically. I've never seen an auto level control like that. You can hear the little motor in there adjusting the levels. I've never seen that before. That is, that's something else. That's a first. I'm sure other people are laughing now that have got one of these decks and they know how it works, but this is the first time I've seen one of these things. So it's like, why was this thing not, why could I not adjust the levels? And then it, I hit the button and the level start, control started working. And then it clicked. I saw this thing turn it. What the hell? It's a, uh, it's an auto level control. It's a poor man's auto level control. See? Neat, huh? Another useless control because, you know, you want to set your levels. You want to set your levels manually for the best sound, but I guess for someone who's in a hurry and they're recording off the radio or something, or, you know, they can't be bothered to ride levels, this will do it, sort of. Anyway, that's beside the point. Let's figure out why this thing's not erasing. Here's the cards down here. It's looking to see where the head is, where the heads are connected on this. Which one is which? Got to figure out which board is which on this. It's a bias oscillator. It's a separate board. Okay, this is the bias oscillator board here. And it looks like it's been broken. Just pull the board out and take a look at it. It looks like someone's broken the board and tried to fix it. Maybe didn't do a very good job of fixing it. Yeah, I would say that there's a crack in that board right there. Let's just see if there's any traces that are that are open. Bet there are. So let's just measure. Looks like someone's re repaired a couple traces here. This trace here comes down over to here. And this one has continuity. Okay, let's go to this other trace. This one comes across to the side over here. And it comes up there. And oh, no continuity. I think it's broken there. Even though someone tried to bridge over it. Let's put a new wire over this and see whether that fixes the problem. 
And this brings to another point. Many of you, maybe you haven't, but there used to be a sign that hung up in any mechanic shop, any TV shop, everywhere. We had one, I think, and it says labor rates. 75 bucks an hour. If you watch, $100 an hour. If you help, $150 an hour. So this unit came from a client that likes to recap their own equipment and brings it to me for calibration and stuff or when it, they get in over their head and they don't, I'm not gonna mention any names here and I don't think the person, the person that owns this is a, is a viewer. And I don't think they're going to admit to causing a problem. But this this is the type of things I really, I mean, I, I love servicing this equipment, but I, I, I really sometimes don't like servicing equipment that people have tried to do themselves or other people have been into because I don't know if there's been any damage caused by someone else. Now, I'm not going to say that the owner of this caused this damage because I'm sure they bought the unit used, but at some point this board has been broken and someone tried to just do a, a quick patch. They did it right on this side by putting a piece of wire over it, but this one here they just kind of got lazy and just stuck some solder over it and obviously it didn't hold up. So that um, is a problem that we run into when people try to fix their own things and it, it adds extra time and uh, of course extra expense because time is money. Anyway, let's get this thing fixed, and I bet you that'll solve the problem with the erase on this. And this thing will sound like a million bucks, and the owner of it's going to be a happy, as happy as a pig. And you know what? Let me get the iron warmed up, and we'll fix that and put it together, and hopefully get it out of here. That soldering iron's not quite quite close enough for this. Just move over a bit here. Ah, oh, I got the small tip on too, which doesn't help matters. We'll just tin the end of this wire a bit. Well, I can just see the, I can just see the haters already. They're going to be bitching about my soldering iron. Like as if I care. You see my haters out there, they seem to think I care what they have to say. And I don't. Because you see, I'm at that point where I have been for a long time. I know what I'm doing. And I think most people that watch my channel understand that I know what I'm doing. That's why I have people that send me items in from all over the country to have fixed. Because they know that I know what I'm doing. I don't need fancy desoldering stations. I don't need anything other than my scope, my digital multimeter, my soldering iron, some solder wick, and my function generator, my audio oscillator. Again, I don't need to prove anything to anybody. We now will have continuity. There we go. Mount the board and uh, turn this thing on and watch it record.
sharpen and show you guys how I got that thing back in, but uh, you don't want to set this thing down on its base and twist it around because that's a good way to break those boards. So I uh, had to kind of manhandle that back into the, to the chassis like this. So I was kind of standing away the camera and I took my fingers off doing it too. They're not the easiest ones to get back in here. Get the screws in and then get it up on its feet. See, there's two support there's two support rails on the bottom that support the chassis the circuit boards hang down below so dragging the unit out and having it sit on the board itself is a good way to uh, to damage them when this bloody thing weighs a ton okay let's try this out levels here make sure I'm plugged in okay what do we got here there we go we shouldn't hear any tone fingers crossed ha 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 there we go our bias anyway there we go it's um, it's recording now properly we'll go to play there's the tone, I'm going to record, actually this thing if I hit record while it's playing, it should punch in. There we go, working. Broken circuit board, again, that's, that would have happened on the prior service I'm sure. Possibly when the owner was putting it together and they rested it on the on the chassis and the weight of the unit and this is say this thing's a beast the weight of the unit uh pressed down on it and, and broke that board or opened that trace up again who knows but anyway that is resolved because we can kick this thing up to seven and a half it's at three and three quarters now Hello. sounding very good I gotta end this tape pretty quick here because, uh, or this video pretty quick. Because I just noticed that my light is flashing, which means I've got about four minutes of uh, recording time left on this memory card before it's full. So let's uh, get this machine back together so I can send it on its way. Gotta pull off the pinch roller to do this. I like this. It comes with a separate print roller in here, a different size one, underneath this head shield. Put that back on there and get the screws in. The units back together one last final test on this thing before I send it on its way and um, because my tape my my memory card is just about full so we'll just fire this thing up make a last recording on it so I hit play okay I'm in 15 IPS. Record.
between the source and the playback at 15 IPS, you can't tell the difference. If I drop this down to the slower speed, you will. You can hear the difference there at the slower speed, right? Treble seems to be more emphasized. Seven and a half, not so much. And at 15 IPS, it sounds fantastic. Get the next song going here. Anyway, I'm out of memory on this thing. Uh, I'm still recording, but it says zero minutes. That's it. This one's done. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one real soon. Bye for now.